case is to be presented by uh, Dr. Densha. Over to you. Okay. So, 24 year old wrestler. He's right arm dominant. He's had a left anterior shoulder dislocation. And this is not during wrestling, this is during a motorcycle accident. So, this is his first time shoulder dislocation. He's put into an immobilizer by his primary surgeon. And he presents to us two weeks after his injury with the history that despite his hand being in the sling, he's felt it pop out and he felt that something locked out there and then he could push it back in position. On clinical evaluation, he's got severe apprehension of instability. So as soon as we get him out of the sling and we even trying to examine his shoulder, he's apprehensive of instability. And with any attempted range of motion, we find that there's a crepitus. You can actually feel a creaking sort of sensation there. Those are his x-rays. And on the x-ray, of course, it's very apparent that he's got uh, anterior glenoid rim fracture or so-called bony bank cart lesion. But when we see his lat attempted lateral x-ray, you can see that that humeral head appears to be at least well centered. We got an MRI done. So in the MRI, we can see that, of course, he's got this big bony anterior rim fracture, so bony bank art. The humeral head seems to be well centered, but besides that, he also has a posterior labral, so he also has a posterior labral tear out here. So you can see that there's an anterior labral tear with the bony bank art. There's a posterior labral tear. The superior labrum doesn't look good at all. And certainly we can see that the biceps anchor is okay, but there's some tissue there underneath there. So I suspected that he also had some sort of a superior labral pathology, but his rotator cuff is all right. That's his 3D CT because we weren't too sure. It's a well-centered humeral head. Is this fragment in position or not? And this fragment is minimally displaced. So. The poll question is, how would you treat this? Would you do a non-operative treatment, shoulder immobilization, so strict shoulder immobilization, try and let it heal in whatever position it does. Would you do an open reduction with an internal fixation? Uh, would you do an arthroscopic repair with a screw fixation of that anterior glenoid rim? Would you do an arthroscopic repair with uh, uh, suture anchors, either single row or double row? So these are all the different options. <coughs> So f the fourth one and the, sorry, one, two, three, four and five. Four and five. So arthroscopic instability repair with anterior anchors, both single row. So single row is the most uh, common one and the double row with the suture bridge. And the second one, which would be open reduction. Anyone chose open reduction? Anyone to volunteer for open reduction for fixation? Okay, so if you were to do an open, the whole question is how would you deal with the rest of the labrum? So I think that has been my sort of uh, uh, difficulty in understanding what would be best for these. Okay, so we'll get on to how I did it. So that's the lateral position. Straight away you can see that that's a bucket handle tear of the superior labrum there. There's also a bucket handle tear of the posterior labrum and that's that displaced anterior rim fracture which has that step in it. So typically I'm going to be dealing with all of these arthroscopic. So the usual uh, sort of recommendation is that if you've got a humeral head that's well centered with a bony rim fracture, that bony rim fracture doesn't require repair. I think that you need to really be careful uh, uh, deciding based just on that. Some of these fragments will have a step. The humeral head could still be well centered and there could be a significant step out there. It may unite but may malunite and then cause secondary arthritis. So I think that any step there beyond two millimeters certainly should be uh, uh, fixed and fixed anatomically. I would prefer to do this uh, arthroscopic because 
you could deal with all parts of the labrum with that. It's difficult to deal with the posterior labrum and the superior labrum if you were doing it through an open approach. So I'm now visualizing from the anterosuperior portal and I've got my working portal which is the standard anterior portal and the posterior portal. So that grey cannula is at the posterior portal and you can see that that's the bucket handle there. Now question is, would you excise this bucket handle of the posterior labrum? It's a huge fragment, it's an acute fragment. He's a young patient so I'm going to retain it and repair it. So I do all the rasping and the preparation there posteriorly. And then I'll start with my suture anchor repair. I'm going to do a footprint type of repair. Now because I'm using a curved delivery device, I don't need to take a subscap portal or a 5 o'clock portal, I can do everything with just the standard three portals. Your anterior superior viewing portal, your posterior portal which is the standard one and your mid anterior portal which is a standard anterior portal and you can do the whole thing from this just because of a curved device. So this is an all suture anchor that goes in just on the face, about a millimeter off the face and my first bite is going to go through the labrum. So this is just below where the bone junction comes. So the labrum is always attached to the bone so you can get an indirect reduction with this uh, suture here. So this suture will bring that fragment up. Now you don't want to tie it down at this stage because if you do then you won't be able to go for your medial row anchor. I then use the same portal and with the curved device I can go on the crater on the medial aspect and I put my anchor there. Now this is very difficult to do with a straight delivery device. So if you've got a straight delivery device, you will certainly require one more portal and that's going to have to go through the subscap and then comes the issue of the nerve, etc, etc. Here with a curved delivery device, you don't need to uh, touch anything as far as the subscap is concerned. Everything is through the rotator interval itself. So this suture is, both sutures are brought out. Now I'm going to use my spectrum and go around that fragment and railroad this suture across. So that medial row anchor now has two sutures going across the fragment and I just need to get them onto an anchor there on the ridge of the, where the bony bank cut comes. <coughs> and you can do a trial reduction and see where is the best position for that. Now you could either put down on a push through anchor there and put it down in one shot or you could use one of your standard anchors and just tie these sutures around. And I prefer to put a standard anchor and tie it down because that makes it much more, it, it, you could actually fine tune your reduction when you're doing it. And finally, one anchor superiorly, which again goes through the labrum. So now once you've got this, I'm going to just spark all my sutures anteriorly and go ahead with my posterior label repair. Now again for the posterior label repair, because this is a curved device, you come in from your standard posterior portal, you don't require an accessory portal for the trajectory and then you go ahead with your standard posterior label repair. In this it's going to be not just the labrum but I'm also going to take the capsule since this guy is a wrestler, I do want to make him, a slight, I do want to make him slightly tighter. Range is not too much of a concern but stability is certainly going to be a concern. So I take the posterior capsule labral path there and then once I've taken all the sutures I need to tie them down. So this is that step that I was, I was saying. So you take a standard anchor here, take one thread from that and then all you need to do is tie it down and you can decide where to tie it and you can fine tune it based on you know uh, uh, how much you tighten. And remember that the knots always go off the rim so those knots are not going to be here unlike a knotless anchor. Knotless anchor you tap it down here and then the sutures come here. Whereas if you use a standard anchor then you can tie the knots there anteriorly and those are not going to cause any further impingement. So I think this is a simple way of taking care of an anterior bony rim fracture or bo uh, bony bank cut and getting anatomical reduction. <coughs> the one concern that's always there is that these sutures go across articular cartilage. How much of a problem are they? Uh, as against say a screw which wouldn't uh, come in the way. And I think that at least in our experience they either synovialize or whatever happens because this is not a weight bearing joint it doesn't seem to create too much of a problem and we've uh, you know evaluated these patients in the long run too and they don't seem to create uh, any problems as far as those sutures are concerned. So finally what did I do? So I also did a 
superior labrum, so posterior labrum and anterior labrum first, and then finally the superior labral uh, repair, which, is, which again, I've not taken out that bucket handle. I repaired it back because that's an acute uh, fragment. So this is what the post-op CT looks like. And you'll see the trajectories there of the uh, anchors. So the medial anchor there, that's the trajectory. You can see that there. So that's the trajectory down there. And the, the lateral anchor just at this part here. And that's how I think that fragment sits into position. And because you're doing a suture bridge, it doesn't angulate and uh, uh, sit up in position. And uh, he actually resumed wrestling within about four to five. He started straining at four to five months and resumed wrestling at six months because it's an acute and it's a bony fragment. It heals really quickly. So he, he, uh, all his return to sport criteria were met at about five months. That's it. Yes, Shirish. Dinsha. Uh, yes. Shirish, Shirish is asking question. That's right. So your medial anchor has the two sutures. Then you've put so one. So both sutures are taken like a mattress. Both right. sutures are go gone across. Yeah. Dinsha, was it double pulley or did you tie each of them? You tie each one individually. So you so tie the first one. Yeah. When you're tying the first one, it's not really going to bring it down because it's both yeah. And your sliding. second one is the deciding one so that you can really fine tune it and make sure with your probe, you're getting it into perfect position. But because you've tied your inferior most labral anchor first, that actually is your reduction suture. That brings everything into position. Then this just makes sure that you've got a nice compression there. So two questions. One is with respect to the double row, double pulley concept. Now the, according to, I, I do the double row, double pulley and I go trans subscap because I always felt a double loaded anchor at the center of the fracture crater with the sutures in a wide array all across from inferior to superior will make sure that there is a, inf there is a proper approximation in medial lateral, superior inferior in all planes. Obviously I saw that you had a very good reduction. Why specifically you have chosen not at the center of fracture crater but at the superior portion because if the hinge inferiorly is intact, this will close well. But if the hinge is weak inferiorly, there is no gripping no, of the, the So it depends on the fracture fragment. So sometimes we actually put two anchors <coughs> on the medial and two anchors on the lateral and then you can do a crisscross. Correct. But if the fragment is not very, very large like this one, you can get away with one medial, one lateral, but each of the sutures goes at a different position. So it's not like in the same position. So because of that, you get that whole bridge, which then brings it into position. You need to be a little more inferior than superior because your fragment tends to go inferiorly. So you need to reduce it from inferior to superior. Okay. And second question was respect to how do you decide how much amount of capsular shift, especially posteriorly, when do you do it? So there are some patients who are having significant external rotation. They are having significant laxity versus some patients who do not have laxity. So preoperative examination, laxity examination, could you share, how do you decide? So not in this patient because there's no preoperative examination here. Opposite He's side. He's an acute. Opposite side. Most of these wrestlers don't have hyperlaxity. So in a sense that all you want to do is get your anatomical repair, but you do want to get a little bit of the capsule, not just the labrum. But it's not going to be like your MDI patients where you're taking, you know, 13 millimeters of a bite and reducing your capsular volume itself. You're just getting a good enough bite so that the tension on that posterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament, once you tension it, you can see a nice taut band out there and it's not lying lax. I think it's just eyeballing. Okay. If I